In the last video, I was having some trouble reading out of these decoder chips and getting weird spikes in the data here. So rather than going through all the different things that I tried, let's just review real quickly what's going on. There's a rotary encoder, which feeds a quadrature signal into the decoder chip, and that has a 32-bit counter, which counts those quadrature signals, and those get put into the Arduino, or are available to the Arduino, eight bits at a time. The reason why it's only eight bits at a time is that each one has its own wire. So you just select which byte that you want and then read the bits out. So they come out in four here. And what I was doing originally was going from the least significant bit up. And the reason I was doing that was so that I could start at index position zero. It just seemed easier. I've had an issue with that before. But most people will read from the most significant byte down. And in going from the least significant byte up, I was skipping the most significant byte on the far end because it was all zero so I didn't think that it really mattered I didn't need it my values were never going to get that high and it wasn't a problem for me yet so for some reason which I was not able to determine even with a friend of mine who's an electrical engineer or a couple friends actually when you read the bytes out backwards from LSB up and you skip the most significant byte when you're doing it very frequently it'll give you those spikes but if you're reading out all of them, you can do pretty much whatever you want and read them out in all sorts of strange orders. So those are the results that I came to. I just started reading all of them out in the right order and everything was fine. I've gotten zero arrows since then. So that's the best that I could determine. And uh, I got to tell you, when I finally got this nice smooth results here at a 50 millisecond interval, I was very, very happy. So with the RPM readings, which is what the encoder is doing, sorted out, it was time to try and improve some other things. The wires that I was using to connect the motor to the controller and then other things were pretty pretty scrawny. These are, I think, 22 gauge solid core, and I just tacked them on there. So we beefed those up to some heavier wire that I had laying around, and it really didn't make much of a difference. So it's time to try some more aggressive modifications. We've run a few tests with our big flywheel here, and it's pretty clear that it's it's much too large but now that i have some numbers from the tests that we've run i have a much better idea of what we need so this one's taking about 60 seconds to get to 450 rpms and i feel like it should be able to get there in maybe two seconds so we're looking at something with the moment of inertia that's 25 or 30 times less or 125th or 130th to be more mathematically correct but um so I've looked at a few different things in the garage that we have. Pieces like this. This could have been a flywheel, but I'm using it to heat things on top of the furnace. And that moment of inertia is too large now that I know what I'm looking for. I've also looked at a few things like this and other pieces in the scrap pile. And these are too small or, or and in addition, I'm concerned that some of them are not the right type of metal. They might be harder or difficult for me to cut. And this piece from the camera control arm, which is still underway, it was another consideration, but I would have to waste a lot of material on the ends, and it would also still be too large in the moment of inertia. So what I'm planning to do is to make a new shaft out of this material, just a piece of shafting I had laying around. We're going to turn that down, and if I make a flywheel, which is about two-thirds the size, two-thirds the diameter of this, with the bulk of that diameter being wood, that should be in the ballpark of 125th to 130th of the moment of inertia of this flywheel over here. And that should give us a much more appropriate load for our small motor that we're testing right now. But we're going to hold on to this big one because I have some other motors and you never know when it'll come in handy. I had the shaft pretty much finished and was just tapping out that center hole when I broke the tap. So normally, like the blind holes that I've done in the past have mostly been vertical. And when you're tapping vertically, the chips from it fall into the bottom of the hole and give you kind of a soft stop. So you can feel the end and then stop cranking it. Well, in this case, it's horizontal and they, they weren't doing that. So I hit the end, it broke it right off. And it was kind of a bummer to trim off that nice end. But we did that, made it shorter, and everything was all right. After that, I made a few marks and measurements to determine the exact dimensions of the flywheel for the shaft that we have now. 
and I cut those out of some ash that I had and I had previously glued up this ash so that the grain was pretty much aligned and so that it was very consistent and strong. So I, there aren't a lot of voids or weak spots in this wood and then when I glued it up I glued it up with the grain perpendicular on each piece and then drilled a hole down the center and epoxied the whole thing in place. With the epoxy cured, it's a pretty simple procedure of putting in the lathe, turning it down, getting everything trued up, a little bit of sandpaper to take any sharp bits off, and that's it. That's our new flywheel. Okay, we're set up with our new flywheel here, and we're going to run this using the exact same settings as before and see what we get. We've got our flywheel situation working much better, but it's clear that this motor and the way that this is mounted on here just isn't going to work. It gets up towards that 2700 RPMs and the whole thing's shaking and doing all sorts of wobbling, which I think is holding back the speed a lot. And I think the problem is the way that this is mounted on here, these motors aren't really designed to be mounted along that axis because any error, any wobble in the set screw it just gets exaggerated as it goes down there. You can even see the CVD itself is wobbling a little bit. Partly that's probably due to the CVD shaft being bent, partly this because I hammered on the ends of the shaft to get it in there. I was using a brass hammer. I thought I was being gentle, but it wasn't, it was too much. So the way that these motors are normally attached to their load is through gears. So I went up to the hobby store and I bought a selection of gears which are appropriate for this. And these are all the same pitch, so they'll go together. And what I want to be able to do is to couple this motor using the standard pinion gear, which looks like this. I want to be able to couple this with the set screw on the shaft and transfer only the rotary motion to the load. So I need a way to mount to the shaft. And I actually picked up this too. This is actually a differential. But the point here is that it has the teeth and the way that it attaches to the shaft is a little ways away from it, so it has pretty good stability this way on the shaft, as opposed to something like this, which must be mounted into a, a flange. So we got a few different options here, and we're gonna try and mount it up, because what this does is it allows the motor to be off a little bit like this, or like this or whatever it doesn't particularly matter or, and also like this sliding so we can just transfer that rotary motion and then if these pieces need to move a little bit like this it doesn't matter it doesn't affect the speed so I think this will be a much better solution and we're gonna give it a shot I think our best bet here is to have that pinion on the motor like so just like a normal RC car and then to use this which is also a pinion but it's for a larger shaft than this motor and we're going to use this set screw to just attach it to the shaft and then couple them together like that. It's also not quite one to one but it's fairly close and we can just correct for that. So we're going to try this first because it's the easiest way to just have that on the shaft and then if necessary we can go to a little bit beefier solutions like some of these other things. It's very windy outside so there may be some extra noise but I've been thinking about ways to attach this onto here because before I used this, which threaded in there, so there's threads and other things inside. And I was a little dubious about how round this was because of the hammering issue. But then I remembered that, first of all, this thing is a five millimeter bore down the center. And I have a five millimeter drill bit, which is a very good fit, obviously, on there. And then I had drilled the larger hole inside of here with this five millimeter bit or one that's extremely close. So that is quite a good fit in there also. And I thought if I had a five millimeter shaft of some kind, what you could do would be to put that shaft in there, drill this a little further and just put this on there, the other way around, and we would be in business. Cut the shaft off, obviously. So what I'm gonna do is just drill this in quite a bit further Fasten this in there, 
and use this as the shaft. It's only a couple bucks for a drill bit and it'll save me quite a lot of time. Plus it's hardened so I know that it'll uh, shouldn't have any issues with attaching to this. Now that we've got our hole ready we're gonna take our drill bit, push that in there. We can simply fasten our thing on there. This is just a test. So the play, well this isn't fastened down. Seems reasonable, or enough that could be handled by the teeth is all we really need. And we can move it in too. This is sort of a worst case here. Like many projects before, I started out trying to make it look somewhat decent and it has devolved into a more practical stage. But we've got our standard flywheel here. We're going to stick the encoder on the end later. And when we come in, we can see our two pinion gears, one on the shaft for the flywheel and then the other on the motor here. And if you look closely, you can see that the motor does move around some when I spin this. There's some play in that, and that's part of the reason why we were having a problem before. But now we have this, and it's hard to see. You can see it a little bit, but there's some play in that, which is what we need for gears. And it seems to run pretty well. And I opted for the clamping system here because it just gives me more flexibility as far as moving the motor this way and that way and this way. Uh, just It's the most flexible right now, and it's easy. Rather than jump back and forth to the graphs a bunch of times, I'm going to do one big shot at the end and we'll talk about the exact numbers on the speeds that we reached. You'll notice that the encoder is wobbling a bit here, and that's because not only is the shaft not entirely straight, but it's just hard to get that thing lined up perfectly right along the axis. So I decided to go with this non-contact uh, encoder, which is an absolute position one, and it required more than a little bit of very careful soldering because I didn't have the right connector to, to plug into there, but we got that taken care of. And the thing with these absolute position ones is that you have to make sure to sample at least once per revolution because it goes from 0 to 4096, it's 12 bits, so 2 to the 12th is 4096, and when you're going between 0 and that number, that's it. So if you've gone more than one revolution, you don't know how far that you've gone. The point here is that you have to be careful about your sampling time, because if you're going 6,000 RPM, for example, that's 100 revolutions every second. So if your sampling time, the delay between when you start and you stop, you and that you record the positions, is greater than 10 milliseconds, you're going to get erroneous readings. So you have to crank your sampling time down. But if your sampling time is too short when you're going at lower speeds, you'll get a lot of noise in your readings. So there's a bit of a conundrum there. What I ended up doing later was adjusting it as the speed increased, and that took care of the problem. It's a little bit noisy, but it gets the job done. It's not super obvious from watching the video, but I got over a thousand RPM boost on the top speed without changing anything besides the encoder that I was using. So it is definitely uh, drawing off a lot of energy. It was going fast enough now, we're getting towards five and 6,000 RPMs that I was starting to become concerned about the possibility of that flywheel letting go and blowing itself apart, which would be very unfortunate, uh, not only for damaging things, but damaging me. So I stacked some encyclopedias around it and I used that for the rest of the inside tests. I switched to a MOSFET based ESC, which I was building, and that ended up being kind of tricky. The thing that I'm using to test it here is an old headlight from a car, and I've gotten so much use out of this thing. I've used it for years and years and years to discharge batteries and test all sorts of things. It's handy because it can handle a lot of juice. So in any case, the MOSFET thing ended up causing me a bit of trouble because they depend on voltage to trigger. And when you have a lot of current in a system and then you drop that, you suck a lot of current down into the, the load, you can change the voltage and... I've got some things to, to learn here, but I'm getting through it, and it definitely worked. Um, when I hooked this thing up, it 
gave another immediate boost to the performance of this flywheel. Such a boost, in fact, that I was no longer comfortable operating this thing inside, so I brought it outside and I set it up with some blast shields, basically. That's a piece of solid granite on the left, and then the wood box and a, a solid concrete block on top of that. And we're gonna, we're gonna test it out here, so if it lets go, it'll not be a big deal. We've run our test so far with this power supply, which is putting out 5 amps at 12 volts at 60 watts. And it was pegged the entire time at 5 amps. A little hard to see on the camera, but I could see it in person. So we know that we can get more performance out of that motor. And electric motors, of course, are famous for drawing a ton of current, especially at the low end. So I have another power supply, which is this one. And this power supply puts out 350 watts instead of 60. So we're going to try with this one instead. That's 29 amps at 12 volts versus 5 amps at 12 volts. And we're outside, so we we'll let some smoke out, it'll be okay. Before dumping all that current into it, I wanted to ease into the, the stress of that test, so I gave it a half throttle, which is what you're seeing here, and that was pretty promising. So after that I gave it a full throttle test, and all it did was click and it fried something, which I haven't determined quite yet. So ultimately here are the numbers we developed with the new wood flywheel. This is the RPM on the vertical axis and the time in seconds horizontally. The motors were given power for 60 seconds and then left to coast down. And so you see 10 seconds of that. And if you start at the bottom with the dark green, you can see the pitiful performance of a regular transistor ESC at partial throttle. It, does, it doesn't even start until I give it a bump with my hand. And above that are the dark blue and the red of full throttle with that same ESC. The orange and the lighter blue increase are due to the new gear-based drive, so skipping that CVD. The next blue and red pair are a result of the new encoder and the decrease in friction that came with that, so we got a boost. The purple and green pair are a result of driving in the correct direction of the motor, by which I mean like the, the timing of it is helping us. So before the motor was actually running in reverse of what its ideal direction was. I just hadn't got around to testing it yet. The light blue is using the, the new MOSFET-based ESC inside, but it was making me nervous, so I shut that one down early, which is why it drops off there. And the orange is the full speed test with the small power supply outside with the MOSFETs, and you can see the noise on there due to the very fast sampling times. Since the numbers are still improving and changing all over the place, I'm not going to calculate the torque or other figures right now, but it's already easy to see how different changes have affected the performance, and the torque is just the slope of the line multiplied by some constants, so the relationship between torque and RPM is already pretty visible here.